Good afternoon, everyone. We're just going to hold a few seconds until all of our participants are in the meeting. Okay, oops, sorry about that. Trying to make sure that I waited and left time to get everybody in the room. So now we have, good afternoon. My name is Paula Davis. I serve as Associate Vice Chancellor for Diversity, Equity and Inclusion for the Schools of the Health Sciences here at Pitt. And welcome to our webinar today, our next installment in the This Is Not Normal Town Hall series. Uh, today, we're looking at the media. The proliferation of media outlets in print, online, and broadcast has provided access to vast sources of information, um, what we know as the news. And this expansive growth in information output also means that traditional editorial processes may or may not be at work in what we see and hear daily. So it's pretty much left to the individual to be a critical consumer of media. How do we know what we are reading or watching is true? How do we filter what we take in in order to protect ourselves? And how does what we ingest shape or change us as individuals and as citizens? We have four absolutely dynamic speakers, <coughs> excuse me, with us today to interrogate those questions and more. From the questions received through registration, I know we'll have some thought provoking exchange today. I would like to introduce our moderators for today. First, Ron Adoko. Ron serves as the Diversity and Multicultural Program Manager for the Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. In his role, he provides strategic and programmatic leadership for diversity and inclusion initiatives that advance diversity as a critical component of social, academic, and intellectual life at the university. Prior to joining the Office for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, Ron served as the director of alumni groups for the Pitt Alumni Association, where he coordinated planning, communication, and facilitation of over 300 constituent groups, activities, and events annually. Ron is my partner in crime in the This Is Not Normal series and a passionate advocate for social justice. Our co-moderator for today is Victoria Garner. Victoria's professional experience includes more than 40 years in the areas of public relations, health communications, and event planning. She is currently the PR and fundraising coordinator for the Program to Aid Citizen Enterprise, or PACE, one of Pittsburgh's oldest African-American-led institutions, with a 53-year history of success in capacity building and strengthening local organizations to effectively improve the lives of the people they serve. A staunch advocate for health literacy and cultural competence, Victoria also serves as the community co-chair of the Community Research Advisory Board, or the CRAB, here at the University of Pittsburgh Center for Health Equity, and also serves as secretary of the Pittsburgh Black Media Federation. A native of Pittsburgh and a proud graduate of the celebrated Shenley High School, Victoria earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in English from Spelman College and a paralegal certificate from the Duquesne University Paralegal Institute. Now to introduce our speakers, let me hand off to Victoria um, or to Ron, um, if Victoria is not on. Oh, Victoria is. All right, Vicki, would you like to come on camera and begin our introductions? Yes, good morning. Um, and um, thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm introducing first off, uh, our first uh, speaker is Andrew Lotz. Andrew is a senior lecturer and academic advisor, assistant dean for undergraduate studies and director of undergraduate studies. Andrew has a PhD and a BA in political science and English writing from Hope College um, at Holland, Michigan, and a master's and a PhD in political science from the University of Pittsburgh. He's currently serving as the Assistant Dean in Arts and Sciences, as well as the lecturer and advisor in the Department of Political Science. His work and teachings have focused on the intersection of pop culture and politics, with special attention to manga, comics, and the Song of Ice and Fire series from Game of Thrones. His current interest focuses on propaganda and myth and their role in regime support. While not flipping through a Judge Dredd comic book or stacks of propaganda, 
Andrew enjoys hobby painting and exploring Pittsburgh. Thanks, <laughs> Victoria. My uh, excessively wordy online bio, someone grabbed it, right? Um, uh, thanks for uh, inviting me here. Um, I think the plan is that each of us is gonna give a couple of minutes of remarks um, and then we'll get to your questions. And in the interest of that, I'm gonna keep mine as relatively short as possible because I wanna hear a lot from our um, the other speakers on the panel, but I'm really delighted to be here and, and thank you um, uh, Paula and Ron and Victoria and everyone for, for making this happen and this continued series as a whole. Um, so I want to focus on three things when it comes to media literacy as someone that thinks a lot about propaganda. Um, it's kind of where my, my mind tends to be. Um, and uh, the, the first of those is, um, you know, for, for a, a, the public when thinking about the, these kind of things is a, a reminder of what people and institutions, governments, candidates, parties, um, writers, reporters, media personalities, what everybody wants, professors, um, us as individuals too, um, what propaganda is, is the, the sort of approach of setting up the public to act in predictable ways. And that's the goal of what um, a lot of communication is to a political scientist when we look at these things. Um, you know, when I think about what the state wants, what political parties want, what candidates want in particular, is they want to continue to be in power. And the best way for them to remain in power is to receive your predictable support. Um, you know, to, for you to keep connecting, for you to keep listening, for you to keep using their language, for you to operate in the world where their story of reality is the one that you're going to follow, um, to be afraid when they tell you to be afraid, to be overjoyed when they tell you to be overjoyed. Um, and so that's the source of power that these units are seeking. And so when we think about being critical of media from a political point of view, um, I often start with that notion of what is, how is this particular communication, any given piece of it or a, a campaign of it, getting me to keep buying in? How is it getting me to keep connecting, keep, um, keep engaging with this? You know, uh, they want our predictable support and use a lot of tricks to get us to behave predictably because then you can govern more effectively, right? If you know the way that people are gonna behave, people are gonna respond, then you can govern effectively. And so that's at the core of my concern when we think about um, this broad area of topics that we're discussing is looking for the actors doing these kind of moves, keeping things predictable and keeping us behaving predictably. Um, second point I wanted to raise initially was um, remembering that those that want us to buy what they're saying, so it's anybody who's, who's selling that predictability, they're gonna behave in odd ways at times because um, they might behave in a way where we could get confused, where we, they might uh, be willing to use less than the truth. They might be willing to play up an issue. They might be afraid to, um, to talk openly about an issue. They might be afraid to call a spade a spade. Um, you know, one of the questions that we, we received was about the capital insurrection and why, why different people um, do different media outlets choose to describe in the way they do. Why do some people not say what it is or um, why are they inclined to frame it a certain way? And it well might be that it's a function of their behavior as someone seeking to get your continued connection, right? And while it might be critically important to describe it one way, somebody somewhere said, well, if we, if we just say this was a, just like a riot, then maybe we won't upset these people, this group of people that we're counting on to continue to consume our product, to continue to connect to our party, to continue to keep voting me into office. And so I'm incentivized to position it in a way that with my power and my continued position of power in mind, um, rather than just, you know, 
saying that. And so we can see this um, in another one of the questions is, is uh, about white fragility, right? Same thing. Right? I can't, you know, I can't, uh, the media can't dive into these things lest they upset a group. And instead of saying, hey, some ups being, being upset doesn't matter. Justice is what matters. But no, we don't want to, we want to make sure that people keep buying, that they keep, you know, keep generating our revenue, keep us in power, keep us being the channel. And so that's why even um, places that are supportive of these things, right, that, that are on their own are supportive, still might hedge on it. And then the third and real quickly is that in our modern media market to a political scientist, the recognition is that the algorithms accentuate these problems. Right? Um, in a spot where what we see gets partially dominated by what gets reacted to, what gets shared, what gets clicked on, what gets upvoted, um, the algorithm is driving the story, and that means extremity is is the answer, right? If I want to be seen, I need to be different than the other, and so I have to go more extreme. And so, you know, I, I gotta I gotta make it the next click noisier. I gotta be a little bit more up, upset. I gotta be a little bit more outraged. I have to, and that pulls on both sides, right? Right, left doesn't matter. Everybody's playing the same clicks and visibility game. And so all these techniques of seeking power and staying in power and staying you know, a, um, in position get accentuated into extremities because of the, the, the space in which it's, it's acting. So that's where my initial thoughts are on some of this. And I'm excited to hear where our other uh, panelists are bringing their expertise and knowledge. So thanks. Thank you, Andrew. I'm gonna pass the uh, baton over to Ron. We thanks Andrew and certainly we look forward to hearing more uh, on that topic and hearing more from you. Uh, I'm here to introduce uh, Brent Mallon, uh, PhD. Brent is an Associate Professor of Communication in the Department of Communication here at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, Brent Mallon studies media history, theory, and criticism with concentrations in cultural studies, critical theory, intellectual history, technology studies, and the rhetor rhetoric of inquiry. His research covers a range of contemporary and historical topics in order to understand the myriad ways in which people's identities are constituted by and through the media. Uh, Brent's first book, American Masculinity Under Clinton, Popular Media in the 90s Crisis of Masculinity, explores conceptions of masculinity offered by a wide range of sources from the 1990s and early 21st century, drawing together analyses of such pop culture examples as Friends, Titanic and The Sopranos and political sources as Bill Clinton's presidential campaign, The Star Report and the debates surrounding September 11th, uh, Brent illustrates how a rhetoric of masculine crisis has been used to support a range of economic, political and cultural aims. Uh, his second book, Feeling, Meditated, uh, Feeling Mediated, sorry, A History of Media Technology and Emotion in America investigates how changes in communication technology change how people think about emotion. Focusing primarily on the early 20th century United States and exploring such diverse technologies as radio and the psycho galvanometer. Oh, wow, big word. The book this demonstrates how a set of assumptions about emotion came to dominate popular and academic thinking about the media, as well as how these assumptions continue to shape our understanding of communication. Outside of these two books, uh, Brent's research has explored a variety of other historical and contemporary issues from media research of early 20th century psychologist Carl, Carl Seashore to the notions of masculinity depicted on the police drama, The Shield, and from 19th century court cases regarding the telegraph to arguments about the democratic possibilities of the internet. Uh, in addition to his teaching at Pitt, Brent, uh, Brent has taught uh, at the University of Iowa, St. Olaf College, Allegheny College, and San Francisco State. Uh, we are excited to engage with Brent. Brent, the floor is yours. Great. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. And uh, thanks, Ron, for the introduction. And thank, uh, thanks to Paula, Ron, and Victoria for organizing this and including me in, in this uh, important discussion. As, as Ron said, I teach in the Department of Communication, and my teaching and research is focused within media studies, including contemporary media and media in a historical context. And so one of the things I'm really interested in is how media develop and change over time uh, and, and, and what stays consistent and what changes. And along these lines, I, in my 
remarks, I just want to very briefly historicize one or two aspects of the, the question of misinformation. And so um, in the US, our news media started primarily as highly partisan newspapers and magazines in what we usually call the partisan press era. As you can probably imagine, these publications were not at all objective and told stories in a way that supported their own political positions. And interestingly, and maybe kind of counterintuitively to most current discussions of media, there, there are media historians who think that this period had many advantages in terms of democratic media because the various publications could debate each other and were explicit about their political positions. And the partisan press era started to change as the US media system became more commercialized. And you know, in the 19th century primarily and into the 20th century, at this point, instead of debating another paper, if I was a newspaper publisher, I wanted to try to steal the other paper's audience. And so uh, I would say things that would please that audience kind of in the way that, that Andrew was talking about. And importantly also the modern concept of objectivity in journalism um, really takes hold at the same time that newspapers are becoming more commercial. commercial. So while there, there might be lots of good things about objectivity in his approach, and we can talk about those, in the US, it's also served a particular kind of profit motive. And so publishing a presumably objective newspaper meant that I could avoid controversial political opinions that might drive away a particular audience. And in, in, in the same way, um, objectivity, many media historians have noted, can serve as a kind of smokescreen for focusing on the interests of the presumed dominant mainstream audience. So, you know, white, middle class, heterosexual, and so forth. And that it under the guise of objectivity. So uh, if claiming to be objective was one way to reach larger audiences and larger profits as commercialism kind of took off, um, sensationalism was another. And sensational news became really prominent in the late 19th and early 20th century. Uh, newspapers would tell stories about disasters and gossip and things like that that they thought would really draw in the attention of readers. And, and the idea of an eye-catching headline really develops in the, the towards the end of the 19th century. So that's these are the kind of stories. And, we're often critical of sensationalism and in many ways for good reason, but depending on how it's used, it can and has also been used to address issues of inequity and inequality and social justice. So uh, journalist Ida Tarabell used the techniques of sentimental fiction in her critical exposés about labor and other business practices of Standard Oil. In a similar way, Ida B. Wells wrote really emotionally powerful stories about lynching that helped to expose the horrible treatment of African-Americans in the early 20th century. So part of what I wanna say is objectivity can be bad and good and sensationalism can be good and bad also in various ways. And, um, and, and both have been around for, for quite a while in, within the US news media and both have comp uh, uh, you know, accomplished various particular aims and serve particular profit motives. And for me, this profit motive is a continuing and central problem in many of the questions and issues we have about our contemporary media, especially when it comes to news and information, but really with most all aspects of our media, uh, you know, we, I think we should be concerned about what it means if our first or central question is whether this story is going to make money. So what happens if, if the first thing we ask about a news or information is whether it can sell cereal or cars or makeup or beer or clicks or, or, or whatever. What kind of stories don't get told then? And of course, um, if one answer is anything that directly questions the value of the profit motive or capitalism. Those stories just are not things that advertisers want to support. But also any story basically that can't be told in a presumably profitable, profitable manner, right? And um, so, for instance, if compared to much of the rest of the Western world, which has a lot stronger public and nonprofit media, the U.S. tells far fewer international news stories, and they tell it in much less nuance and much less depth. On the other side, though, we do have stories about travel to other countries because those things can sell plane tickets and hotel rooms and things like this. And so I think um, the centrality of the profit motive this, you know, this has not changed with Facebook and Twitter and Google or YouTube, which, you know, the things that provide or fi filter information for many people today. And, um, and so public media, having public media or nonprofit media can't cure 
the pro all of the problems that plague our media today or certainly our world more generally. But I want to argue at least in these comments that until we have a strong nonprofit source for news and information, we're going to continue to see problems with this and misinformation. And even our good information is going to be narrowed in the ways that commercialism demands, which is also a problem. And so I want to say that quality information needs to be more needs to be about more than the profitability of that information. But this is largely where our mainstream media is today and, and, and has been for, for some time. So I'm going to stop my comments there and uh, thank you. And I'm also really looking forward to the discussion. You're on mute there. Uh, Vicki, you're on, you're on mute. I'm, I'm sorry, my apologies. Um, I was thanking Brent for his, uh, for his comments and I'm looking forward to further discussion. Um, I'd like to next up introduce Kevin Michael Smith. Kevin is currently the Director of Undergraduate Studies, Broadcasting, Senior Lecturer, and Kevin is, um, and Screenwriting Instruction at the University of Pittsburgh. He's responsible for designing and implementing the broadcast curriculum at Pitt. Recently, Kevin was named principal and executive producer of One-on-One -on -One Entertainment, the first ever Hollywood-based virtual movie studio and content network. Kevin is an active member of the Writers Guild of America and an award-winning screenwriter. His feature film, Pride, was produced by Lion Gates Film and starred Academy Award nominee Terrence Howard and the late Bernie Mac, and also received an SB nomination for Best Sports Movie of the Year in 2007 as well as Movie Guide's Top 10 Films for Mature Audiences Award in 2007. Two more of Kevin's feature film productions, The Pittsburgh Powder Cakes, directed by Chris Wilson, and The Heartbeat, directed by Reggie Hudlin, are scheduled to be released in 2022 and 2023. Kevin currently has a stage play, Gardell, currently in development. As a scripted television writer and veteran broadcaster, Kevin's radio broadcast career began with the New York City radio station WHTZ Z100 and the original Z100 Morning Zoo. Later, Kevin served as executive producer for the Pittsburgh Penguins hockey team, where he designed the two-time Telly Award winning and Emmy nominated magazine show called Penn's Confidential. As a writer, producer, reporter, and anchor at WTAE TV in Pittsburgh, Kevin garnered two Telly Awards, four regional Emmy nominations, four Golden Quill Awards, four Associate Press Awards, a National Headliners Award, and the prestigious Edward R. Morrow Award. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you so much. That's so kind of you. Holy, I, I may have to write that stuff down to uh, use it in a future use for, uh, for anything. Uh, but uh, I, I greatly appreciate it and, uh, and thank you. I, I really truly wanted to, uh, I love what uh, we've discussed so far, and I'm actually stimulated by some of the discussion because one of the first things I wanted to discuss was the original implementation of news. And uh, news, the word itself has uh, carries quite a few connotations. Interestingly enough, it is also an acronym um, when it was initiated. News is, uh, it actually stands for the dissemination of information, North, East, West, and South. And that's the origin of where that had been used for the world of broadcasting. To that end, I, when I work with journalists and with students, I like to point out to them uh, the original intention of using broadcasting in the news world and in a news forum was for disseminating information. Uh, to that end, uh, the responsibility that comes with that was distorted. And uh, as Brent touched upon and Andrew touched upon, there's a number of forces and, and reasons for it, in particular, whether it's capitalism, uh, power, uh, which I'm, I'm anxious to chat about. But the responsible, responsibility of journalism in, initially on television, because of it reaching the masses at uh, literally light speed, uh, was to educate. And to that end, that was lost. Uh, a great example of how modern media has been misused. I will take you back to 2008. And uh, many of you may remember this when uh, Reverend Jeremiah Wright, who is the pastor of uh, Trinity United Church in Chicago, um, he also um, presided over uh, President Obama and Michelle Obama's wedding, as a matter of fact, thus 
President Obama was seated in the audience during one of his sermons uh, while he was running for office. Uh, and the sermon was based on confusing God and government. Now, during that sermon, there was a uh, Reverend Wright. Uh, one line was extrapolated from that sermon by the news media. And the line he used was, God damn America. And many of you may remember him using that and how it was sensationalized in the media. Uh, the media used it to uh, basically extend and promote whatever talking points they wanted to. And again, we'll get into those things. The idea situation or ideal situation would have been if the media explained why he was saying that, thus educating the masses and the public. Uh, Reverend Wright, you could have taken Reverend Wright back uh, some time to not only when he was a Marine and his experiences, but also some of his training, which was in the South. And as we all know, uh, in uh, many of the Southern states, in the Deep South in particular, Jim Crow laws and Jim Crow was enforced by the government. To that end, one of the rules of Jim Crow was that uh, African-American males, more than two, cannot uh, uh, meet publicly. Thus, they can be arrested. To that end, uh, African Americans started to have discussions within the confines of their church environment. A good example is the Southern Baptist Church. Uh, if you were a Caucasian in the Southern Baptist Church, especially during that era, it would be a normal one hour Sunday service. To that end, an African American Southern Baptist Church would have a service that not only would last an hour, but it would also turn into a community event because that's where the issues were discussed on whether it was how do we vote, education, numerous community issues. So it was, it was almost a day long event. To that end, once many of the uh, racial elements in the South realized that these discussions were taking place, church bombings started taking place because of the understanding of this is where this information was being disseminated. If you're a pastor, there is nothing more sacrilegious than having the home of God ex basically destroyed simply because of someone's racial opinions and beliefs. Thus, the, the understand how that festered inside of Pastor Wright for all of those years, among other, obviously, things that occurred in his life, and then it came out in that way as he was discussing it in the uh, confusing God in the government. So to be able to provide an educational background, as, as Brent said, uh, as a historian, that's crucial to explaining moving forward. The key is, is getting people to listen to the why something happens in order to understand where it's going to go. So I'm looking forward to kind of discussing a number of those elements um, that we've already touched upon. And I'm extraordinarily stimulated by this amazing panel that you have. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Kevin. I appreciate the insight. And again, certainly we're, we're going to be coming back to you for some additional uh, insight and feedback. And so we'd like to now introduce our final panelist, uh, Dr. Tara J. Yasso. Uh, Tara is a first generation uh, college student, was a first generation college student, professor in the Graduate School of Education at the University of California, Riverside. Uh, she earned her bachelor's at UCLA and a major she designed a social psychology of education with an emphasis in Chicano studies. Uh, she also earned her PhD at UCLA in the Graduate School of Education and Information Studies and Urban Schooling. Uh, she was recruited to UCR uh, with a cluster hire with a focus on diverse populations, uh, what America Paredes considers Greater Mexico. Prior to UCR, she worked as an assistant and associate professor in the Department of Chicana and Chicano Studies at UC Santa Barbara, and as a professor in the School of Education at the University of Michigan. Uh, Dr. Yasso's research and teaching apply the frameworks of critical race theory and critical media literacy to examine educational access and opportunity. She takes a collaborative, intersegmental, and transdisciplinary approach to studying the ways communities of color have historically utilized an array of cultural knowledge, skills, abilities, and networks to navigate structures of racial, racial discrimination in pursuit of educational quality. She has authored and co-authored numerous chapters and articles and publications such as the Harvard Educational Review, a Journal of Popular Film and Television, and History of Education Quarterly. Her research is extensively cited within and beyond education, for example, her article, 
Whose Culture Has Capital, a critical race theory discussion of community cultural wealth has become the top cited article in race, ethnicity, and education since its publication in 2005. The American Educational Studies Association recognized her book, Critical Race Counter Stories, along the Chicano, uh, Chicana Educational Pipeline with a 2008 Critics Choice Book Award. She has been awarded a Ford Foundation Postdoctoral Fellowship for Diversity and Excellence in University Teaching and was honored by the Critical Race Studies and Education Association with a 2017 Dirk Bell Legacy Award. Uh, Dr. Yasso, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I am going to uh, immediately share my screen to try to maximize the time that we have together. I, I very much appreciate um, this invitation and here we go. Okay, um, I wanted to begin by talking about four main points and I wanted to uh, appreciate this um, discussion that we've had already. So the, these, the four main points that I would like to kind of push forward is that I do analyze film and I, and I focus mainly on entertainment media. And I do so uh, because I have always been um, very struck by not only is this the, the main narrative that continues to, uh, to put forward information under the guise of entertainment, uh, but films are very unique in some ways that they are specifically created for mass distribution and they are replayed across generations. And so I begin here with uh, the comment by uh, Stuart Hall that the media do construct for us as part of the ideological labor that they enact um, a definition for what race is. Um, the, the meaning and imagery of race carries and what the problem of race is understood to be. Uh, so I begin with this remark um, and I begin with these images to just remind us of the idea of intentionality um, that Hollywood studios do recognize and capitalize on the power of films to influence public perceptions and social policy. And this is just one example here of World War II where uh, President Franklin D. Roosevelt's administration created the good neighbor policy and recruited Walt Disney's assistance to court war alliances in Latin America. And so this collaboration resulted in at least two uh, animated films where you have um, singing uh, birds that are supposed to be uh, from Latin America and talking about the music and cultural wonders of Mexico and Brazil, um, 1943, 1945. And then by the end of World War II, for the most part, Hollywood returned to the practice of portraying uh, Mexicans and Latin Americans, and um, they have a difficult time with what they have called us. Um, and, and a difficult time for many of us to even recognize some of those uh, images. Um, but these are two examples of the um, promiscuous woman and the stereotypical villain here, the bandido. This is uh, from Duel in the Sun and the Treasure of the Sierra Madre, 1946 and 1948. And so Hollywood depictions of Latinas and Latinos um, really have, resurrect these troubling racial myths. And, um, and they have changed very little over the last century of filmmaking. So the treacherous bandido of old Hollywood films has evolved into the violent cholo in the contemporary cinema um, or the Latina spitfire, um, which began as the, the harlot, the hot tempered, uh, sexually promiscuous. And uh, this, for me, I am looking at these actually two images are from the film 187, which came out in 1997 and situates this history within schools. And so um, my degree is in education. I, since an undergraduate, have been very interested in my second point here, which is how we teach through film and what are we learning through film? films again that are disguised as entertainment. And so I have um, really built on the work of Carlos Cortez, um, who talks about this so-called entertainment media um, having, I'm sorry, 
my images disappeared on you, um, having a major impact in shaping the beliefs and attitudes and perceptions and knowledge. And I don't know why it keeps disappearing, but I'm going to try it one more time. Um, so I, uh, I have focused on these films at least nine times um, that begin with Blackboard Jungle. So I'm sorry that they're disappearing on us, but um, I wanted to talk about the, the purposefulness of this media pedagogy and how it is an amplified and distorted or incomplete view with a patronizing narrative that uh, is occurring when you can identify at least one um, Latina or Latino inside a high school classroom or a story that is told around high schools. Um, most often, they it begins with um, a story that is supposed to be uplifting. It started with Blackboard Jungle, and so I'll move to this next slide. Um, the there is a legacy. So if we can understand that. Um, there are historical continuities of these one dimensional portrayals across time, then the question that that we might ask ourselves is whose perspectives are portrayed and what purpose does this serve. And so when we look at Blackboard Jungle specifically, I'm not just looking at the patterns across all of the films, and that I also look at the time of their production and the uh, politics of the, of the production. And there was a very specific goal with Blackboard Jungle that the producers had to address issues of juvenile delinquency that they saw as being um, pouring over, they, they explained, into schools. This actual film at the very beginning, um, it indicates that uh, this is their overt goal. That's what the rolling text is as it introduces. I look specifically also at the characters. This character here is Pete Morales. He is supposed to be um, Puerto Rican. Um, and he is having a difficult time speaking without cussing. There are censors at this time. And so he's, I walk down the stinking street, I uh, talk to go to stink face. And he says, oh, what are you doing, Pete? And I said, we go to school. And so um, at, behind him, you see an American flag and you see um, an elementary style alphabet. And there is a very specific um, juxtaposition that they are placing here to um, demonstrate that this in this integrated school in 1955 is the timing of the film um, that he does not belong in this space that there is something that is off here um, the the teacher daddy a as they call him or um, daddy o um, his um, is played by Glenn Ford he goes back to his original um, school where he was a novice teacher and where his father is is the the, lead, the headmaster and they are all white students singing in unison and learning Latin and it's a completely different portrayal of an integrated New York City public high school uh, and uh, this plays itself out also in films all the way until 1995 this is Dangerous Minds which begins in East Palo Alto um, which at the time um, had the highest homicide rates in the country, and uh, they are busing these students in to schools in Palo Alto proper, which had at the time the highest SAT scores in the country. And it, they begin with images of death and everything is in black and white. And they do not colorize the film until it gets to the suburbs and it gets to the school that is supposed to signify the, the only source of hope for these students. And so this really, um, this amplification of uh, these ideological messages basically comes through at least nine and plus times um, through this Hollywood, what, what has now become known as an urban school genre it has been um, so made famous that uh, they can uh, parody it and folks will immediately recognize this genre. The, they most often are portraying uh, what they believe to be an oppositional um, 
portrayal, but there is a purpose to it, which is to try to uh, show that if you get a teacher, most often a white teacher, most often a female teacher um, into a classroom by virtue of her whiteness, she can help these students and pick them, pull themselves up by their bootstraps and they can pull themselves out of their quote unquote culture of poverty. Um, so this um, really for me helps me think about um, if we have this intentionality, we have what is the lesson, what's on the lesson plan here, and that looking at the timing of these films. Historically, when you think about portrayals of Native Americans, we think about portrayals of Asian Americans, we think about portrayals of Pacific Islanders, you think about portrayals of African Americans, and you think about portrayals of Mexicans and Puerto Ricans, Latinas and Latinos you think there, there are some continuities, what Natalia Molina talks about as racial scripts. These scripts are employed in one era and then picked up and used and adapted in, in different ways for different purposes in other eras. And for me, what I am trying to understand in uh, some of my continued research is how do we uh, justify a continued separate and unequal schooling system, one of the ways in which we do that is we repeat these messages of how students of color bring problems into our schools, students of color as problem in, in schools, uh, and therefore structures themselves staying intact and hyper segregated spaces uh, become justified across time. Uh, so that that for me, understanding that impact uh, is not just an individual trying to measure like a magic bullet that someone goes into a film and their whole life is changed, but rather how through repetition and the resurrection of uh, these um, racial myths and these repetition of these scripts across time uh, and different groups also pits us against one another with these narratives. So that's what I would like to leave you with in our discussion today. Um, it was mentioned, uh, for example, that um, two African-Americans walking together in the Jim Crow South would be arrested um, in the 1990s as a bilingual aide in at uh, Lenox Middle School. Um, I am calling them out. Um, six uh, Chicano students, six Mexican-American or Salvadoran at the time students, um, walking together were sent home and identified as a gang at lunchtime. Um, so how, how this continuity across time occurs, um, to understand that, and to also just leave you with this idea that these histories are always contested that we have not only filmmakers contesting these, but we have people walking out on the streets recognizing that the elicitation of a word bad hombre and putting and does not justify putting children um, in cages. And there was mass protest and those contestations occur also across generations. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tara, for um, that presentation and, and that wealth of information. Um, we're gonna move to the Q&A section of the webinar today. I'd just like to preface it by saying that we have some initial questions we'll be asking, and then we'll engage the questions that were submitted by our um, audience and participants. Um, the first question is for Tara and for Brenton. And I would ask that um, once Tara and Brenton finish their remarks, um, if Andrew and Kevin would like to chime in, please do. And so the first question is, what role does mass media play in the process of identity formation and maintenance? Uh, I, I would call upon here the work of Carlos Cortez and others who have um, really helped us, uh, and actually, and also the work of Chester Pierce, who looked at uh, racial microaggressions uh, and looked at those through uh, media as well. So this idea of repetition, that there is an impact um, that, that it does occur over time. And at the same time, um, because we know this, um, there is the, the power of critical race media literacy should happen early and ongoing with children. And there have been multiple examples of engaging students in um, 
critically understanding newspapers and and making films themselves and taking pictures and doing all of these types of engaging them with that, they can see that media is a construction and that their perspectives, this more multi-dimensional perspectives are possible to create. All right. All right. That, uh, let, let me just add that I think that uh, everything uh, that uh, Dr. Yasso just said makes a lot of sense to me. And I'll, I'll just add that there's a lot of theories about how media influence identity, you know, and, and it's, it's a discussion people have been having a lot. So I, I just want to I just want to make kind of one one small point that I think is kind of interesting related to what people people have said. So um, in, in like the 50s, in, uh, at least in media research in, in the US, it, 40s and 50s, it started to become popular to say that the media actually didn't have very many impacts on people's identity. And, and, and part of that was coming out of this kind of earlier research that people later would attribute as, as putting too powerful a, an influence on, on people, you know, on the media. And so, and, and so they said, actually they had minimal effects. And so there was a bunch of these theories and, and I'll, I'll just point out kind of one of those, one of those minimal effects theories, which I think is very interesting to what we're talking about. And it, uh, a theory grew out called agenda setting that said that uh, the media does not actually tell people what to think, but what to think about. And so it was like, OK, so that was their way of saying, oh, it doesn't influence people's thinking. I think there's actually lots of lots of work to discredit that now, actually, that the media influences thinking in, in a lot of ways. And part of it had to do with the early research. People were looking for like direct correlations with behavior rather than like these kind of questions about ideology and how people think. But but let me just say this about agenda setting telling people what to think about is actually very, very important, right? It's not a minimal effect. That's a huge, that's a huge effect that, that they've, that this research supposedly found. And I think like all of these topics. So when we're talking about these things, you know, about like, we think about like polarized media and, and I think like some of those researchers might say, oh yeah. So if there's a polarized, you know, perspective about, what you pick the topic. I mean, critical race theory is one of these things actually being covered in the media in a very polarized way, right? And so, um, for instance, right? And so, but putting that, making people think about critical race theory in this way also has a, has impacts, right? And, and whatever it is, thinking about elections in a particular, whatever topic it is. So I think that's, so, when we think about how is it that media influences people's identity, I mean, I think it's 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 in so many ways, right? It's it's how we learn about ourselves and each other in our communities, you know, from really from when we're from when we grow up till till you know it continues on through our lives. You know, what what do we know about what's happening in our world right now? Those those things, all of those. So I think it's very important. Obviously, you know, that's why I study it. But uh, I'm I'm also interested to hear what other people. I have to say too. And Andrew and uh, Kevin, uh, please feel free to chime in. Well, you know, I, I found it fascinating uh, with that question because um, I, I love that we're touching upon these, these specific subjects. One of the things when it comes to what people perceive is presented as visual. Again, we're in a visual medium in, in this society. And when it comes to on-air presentation, especially of people of authority, say anchors, uh, hosts, whomever, think about the lack of diversity that exists in that world. And it's not just on the air, but it's also behind the scenes, the part that people don't really see. Most people just believe that what they see on TV when it comes to an anchor, a host, those are the only people that actually are physically at a facility to get something on air. They don't understand the various intricacies that go on behind the scenes. To that end, a good example is when you think about, for example, we'll just touch upon, let's think of the three, right now, the three most uh, polarizing networks, if you wanna call them that, when it comes to MSNBC, Fox, but CNN. CNN being thought of as of those three, the most neutral of the three. But to that end, I, I'd like to uh, share a quick screen with you, if you don't mind, and that is simply, Look, if you look at the diversity or lack of on the one of these three networks that is perceived as the one that is most relatable. And 
there's a tremendous lack of diversity. And that's on the one that is considered the one that is yeah. that we can most associate with, whether it's the corresponding reporters or whether it is the people who are presenting the information. So again, the the way that something is presented to you, it's similar to how we looked at history with, again, um, with no representation, whether it was Barbie dolls, whether it is, uh, of course, uh, legendary depictions of Santa Claus, which most people don't even know the current depiction of Santa Claus comes from Coca-Cola. So little things like that that are presented to American society are shaping the, the thought process of so many people when it comes to acceptance and, and respect and representation. So, Andrew, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this as well, personally. Oh, and I, I'd, I'd just add in, um, which may, might help briefly kind of draw a line between some of the comments would be that the, uh, like, it's, it's even control of language itself, right? That's, that's the critical thing. If I, if, um, you know, the, the, even the discussion of why we would call something critical race theory or not, why we call uh, a group, um, uh, you know, the, the difference between undocumented and illegal is huge, right? And so power, people positioning themselves when they make even the word choice, let alone the, the presentation of the image choice, um, that there's, they're, they're playing with these systems of power and replication of power. And so, you know, if, if they're, if we're replicating the very language of us being sort of um, in a way, then, then we should be surprised that the way continues and that those in power keep being able to replicate power. Appreciate the insights and, and we want to kind of build off of that question. And so uh, I, I want to target this question to, to Kevin, but certainly again, we want all the panelists uh, to think about chiming in. Um, what is the role of the media in perpetuating white norms? And uh, a number of that was evidenced in some of the feedback. What, what is their, their role uh, in perpetuating those norms and inequities in our culture, right? Uh, in, in what way is the media culpable in perpetuating these uh, norms and these inequities? And what are the uh, other sorts of impacts of the media's behavior uh, when it comes to the perpetuation uh, of these norms and these inequities and, and these sorts of stereotypes? Thank you. That's a very, that's a great question. Obviously, it's uh, an intricate, intricate question. Um, a great way to explain to me, I was once told, and uh, Andrew touched upon this actually, that if you think about it, and I'm going to take you through a little thought process of wars are, thought, are fought over only three things, money, power, and land. Now, a war can be just two people arguing, but those are the only three things that wars are ever fought over. So understand that when anybody is represented at any time, the threat of power being taken away, they're going to defend any way that they can. The utilization of any kind of um, media outlet. Number one is understand that it is a corporation. Its sole purpose is to make money. And I, and I hate to break the news to everyone, that's its sole purpose. It has, there's no altruism whatsoever when it comes to media outlets. Uh, or else they wouldn't have a board of trustees. It's as simple as that. But that, to that end, um, the competition to make money from a limited audience, because it is a finite audience that you are working with, thus creates that, that environment of whatever worked, you perpetuate. You do not sit there and try a new norm to find a way to make money. You, I always, uh, I try to teach my students and work with others to explain it is familiar. You want to have something that's familiar yet unique. You are not going to go with something unique and scare away people. You always go with something familiar to attract and then add the unique element to keep people watching or in, interested. So to that end, the focus has always been on who has had the power and will they relinquish it, which is the answer is always gonna be no. It's a matter of how do other people introduce themselves so that those that are in power believe that they also get what, again, money, power, or land as a byproduct of inclusion, or else there's no point for inclusion, if that's the case. So uh, that's the best way that I can describe it. And, and that is the challenge. 
Uh, again, the simplest way to put it is, sim is by simply saying, you're not allowed to play the game if you don't, know, if you don't know the rules. Now, once you're included into the game, and if you're having too much success, the rules will change. And, and that's the easiest way to explain how the structure that exists now is the challenge for any kind of inclusion or change of diversity. I hope that answered some of the question. Absolutely, we'd love to uh, hear from others if there are additional thoughts on this question. I'll, I'll just make one comment and, and thank you. It's a great question. And thank you, Kevin, for all your thoughts. And I just want to just point to a link that I put in the, in the chat, which was for this, this platform called open TV. It's like where EO.TV is actually the, the, the address, but that it, it would be great to check that out. Cause that shows you that it, it's a, it's a platform for intersectional television is, is kind of how they frame themselves. And you could see just like, it's so different than anything you'll see on mainstream television. And, and, and I think what this shows is, again, it's nonprofit. So I think it, one of the things it shows is when you kind of take out the profit motive, you can, what, what's possible, right? And, um, and the other thing that it shows, like, I think one of the arguments people will try to make if, the, if they're kind of defending the, the, you know, like in many things, it's like a pipeline argument. There just aren't enough producers of color or performers of color. And you can see that's just absolutely not true. You go to this site and you see so much, like such diversity of producers, of directors, of performers. So it's really about opportunity. And it's really about, you know, I mean, Kevin pointed to the problem of kind of the finite audience. There is, there's only a finite audience because of the model, right? Because we think we have to make money off of, off of these audiences, right? If, if it wasn't an issue of money, then, you know, you could do whatever, just like there's lots of experimentation in art, especially art that doesn't need to make money because you don't have to have a million people looking at your painting at the same time, right? Um, and so, so I think that I would get, I would recommend checking this out. Open TV. It's a great, it's a great platform, and it's a great group of people that are, that are producing it. And and I think it just shows how you could have, we could have a much more diverse media if we if we were deliberate about trying to make that happen. Yeah, I just wanted to add briefly that. Uh... These these issues occur by omission and commission. So it's not just what you see, but what you don't see. And so I think of that highlighted by whose perspectives are, are brought to the screen that really tells that story very well. And um, and I, I also would like to kind of, I guess the, the emphasis of like understanding the our, our history is basically like that really is the connection across time is that we, uh, there is an edge, always an educational component because whoever is bringing those perspectives forward may not know multiple perspectives. And just because you are a person of color doesn't automatically mean that you have everyone's perspective accounted for there. And just because you're white doesn't mean that you're not going to account for certain perspectives. And so it is, it is also, you know, the, these are these are some of the many elements so that when you look across um, these different spaces, you can see where someone has gone the extra mile and done their historical, their due diligence and looked at some of the, the multiple perspectives and brought some history to bear. There's a question, um, one of the many great questions on there, but there is a question on there about um, how, um, college students today might better engage in digital activism. And I do think that part of that is calling people to task for being ahistorical, for just straight up being ahistorical. That is an, an intentional distortion. It is a distortion to omit entire people's histories. Now you might be ignorant about those histories, but you are intentionally ignorant if you are continue to perpetuate, especially after being called out on that. Um, and, and I also just wanted to remark about, um, there has been some amazing um, independent productions as was mentioned as well. I, and I do think that it is, um, it's always been done. Um, the black press in particular has been 
vital to telling these other elements of our, our histories. And I think that our elders um, in, in various communities have known that getting the, getting the, you know, that there was a, always a larger purpose to telling our stories. Our stories need to be told and to be passed on. And uh, I think that it's also the way that we consume it. So I think I appreciate the way that we, we are not, at, at, for our survival as communities of color, it has been really to share our stories and to share our strategies of survival. Um, not to just uh, not in an extractive way to gather other people's stories, but as a as a means of survival. And so I think that recalling that history and calling our our media platforms to account for what purpose they are they are held to a totally different. They're called to do something completely different. And so I think that understanding what their purpose is and understanding what our survival is based on and dealing with that tension is really where, where we need to focus some of our attention. Thank, thank you everyone for your comments to that question. Um, I'd like to direct the next question to Andrew. Um, much of what's broadcast by and through particular media outlets, platforms and personalities is patently false. Can you describe uh, the payoff for media outlets and sowing strife? Ah, uh, great, great, great query. Um, uh, I think there's there's a couple different ones. Uh, I think there's it's like a it's not a it's not a one reason alone, right? That 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 someone chooses the option of of strife. Um, I think there's a, a, like a whole host of factors that add up to it. Um, there's purposeful and non-purposeful probably. The purposeful would be um, things like, um, you know, I, I know I get a more captive audience if I play to fears, right? And so I'm going to purposely play up fears even when things aren't as scary as we think they are, or as I'm picturing them or presenting them, you know, this is not, uh, we're, we're not in this sudden crisis, right? Uh, this is not as, as big a concern, but um, by playing to fear, I'm banking on the fact that you're going to have to keep listening to me. You're going to stay connected to me. Um, if I can give you um, sort of like the, it's almost like an abusive behavior, like abusive relationship behavior, right? Is, is, I, I frighten you and then I position myself as the only source of solution. And so therefore you, you get into a disorganized relationship with me and you, and therefore you're stuck being sort of like, well, you know, the, whether you're telling me the truth or lying, since you've been using fear this whole time, I'm stuck in the pattern. I have to be here. And I lose my ability to kind of keep my sense of, of, what's actually worth fearing or not in place, as long as the, the actor in the dominant position keeps playing that same sort of loop over and over, which can lead to, you know, grabbing new issues and, you know, constant turnover and, and things like that. So I think there's purposeful stuff like that, um, that, that, is, that is a part of the story for the incentive to do that. Uh, as I mentioned a little bit in my remarks, the, the algorithms don't help Right. Um, if I, uh, yeah, the, the, the mask, <laughs> being against masking, being against um, vaccines is a really intriguing one with COVID, for instance. Right. What it's like, <laughs> how did a, how did we get to the point where a public health action became something where political parties said, we can make hay by being the opposite? Right. Ah, my opponents have pictured themselves as this. I I get benefit by being not that, you know. And so there's some of the extremities and the algorithm, I think, plays into that more. The, the need to be extreme, the need to be seen as different, the need to get recognized means I have to be more extreme. And then I think there's a whole bunch of unintentional or underintentional stuff, maybe would be the right way to put it, where it's like informational differences, right? Where, where two parties 
they, 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 what stems from the way, way back of it is they disagree about some fact. And if they actually kind of had a conversation about that, they might say, wow, we're, we're really on the same page. But you go way down the list and it's, you know, what the way I see this world is a world of, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, us is at stake or the, um, you know, the, the they're, they're trying to paint me as the problem or, you know, this is a um, this is the aim of this. This is the aim of that. There's, there's all sorts of like, wait, wait a second, you know, uh, critical race theory, for instance, is a good example, right? It's not about sort of making white individuals feel bad about themselves. It's not some self like target flagellation machine, right? It's about equity and equality. And if some introspection has to happen along the way, that's everybody's introspection and everybody's conversation. But there are people that get in their head, oh, this is what this is about. And then they're going to replicate the problematic approaches to it constantly because they're starting from that position way, way back of, oh, this is what this is about. And, and there are subtleties of why people would want to position us to, to start in those positions, I think. So uh, I'd love to hear from others, their thoughts there. Thank you, Andrew. Do we have any other comments from any of the panelists? If you don't mind, I, I think Brent hit on something. And, and one other thing I'd like to touch base, or not Brent, that uh, Andrew hit on and, and touch base with. The other part of that is, and unfortunately, again, I hate to harp on it, the capitalist part, whereas there's a misconception that various outlets are competing with one another, and they're not. Um, they're competing with it. And because of that, it exacerbates the issue that we're discussing. For example, if you, and I'm going to use the three main networks that we're familiar with only because of the dissemination of information that goes from them. Uh, if you think of uh, Fox News Network, you have Hannity, Ingraham, and Tucker Carlson. Their competition is not MSNBC or, or, or CNN. It's not as if somebody at Fox one day who watches their channel is suddenly going to go, you know what, I'm going to start watching MSNBC. They're, they're, they're going to have, they have a finite audience, which means that they can tell their uh, ad, their sales department, we have X amount of people watching us from this hour to whatever hour. So our rates for our sales can consistently stay at a certain point. And MSNBC can do the same thing, whether it's Wolf Blitzer, or Anderson Cooper, or or capable then, or uh, um, I'm sorry, that's CNN or, or Haley Jackson and, and Rachel Maddow at MSNBC. Their competition is within. So for example, the audience that Hannity has is identical to the audience that Ingraham has, as well as Tucker Carlson. So they're fighting over what advertisers are going to be on their individual programs within their own company, which means that the sensationalism has to increase. It's no different than morning talk radio when there's a sensationalist radio. Why do they say something more outrageous? Well, because the other person said something and now they're going to steal some of your audience. So it perpetuates itself from within, but the competition isn't within those three networks. The competition's within, its own, within itself and that's what feeds it to keep going further. Kevin, if I may real quick, that's the exact same process in the, in the political party too. Yes. Right? Like the exact same animals going on where it's, if I, because of our primary system, yes. I have to be the bigger and the more extreme. Um, yes. I had a conversation with someone who was um, running for Lieutenant governor of Virginia um, a cycle or two ago. Uh, he was a Republican and he had like a 98% rating by the NRA and he was wringing his fists because his opponents had a hundred percent. And he's like, my 98 is not good enough. And he ended up right. losing the election, <laughs> the yeah. primary. And it's like, that's why that competition, I mean, you're, I think you're spot on with, with that diagnostic. I love that, that way of describing it. It's within the network. Itself. Thank you. Thank you. I would just add one thing that, you know, some of this starts also with the emergence of 24 hour news. So yes. that when you have networks that are trying to keep that, keep people on the network for, so these stories that they just want to have stories that go for a very, very long time. And I, and I will say, actually, CNN was one of the real instigators of this because yeah. they were one of the first 
first uh, networks to really, you know, be a 24 hour news network. So their first Gulf War coverage, they just really, they, they made a lot of money. And so they just try to keep, keep the story going as, as long as they can. And if I can, I just want to tie in really quickly then, because that's that's back at this profit question. Just a question about kind of nonprofit. There, we had like a couple questions about these. So I, I just want to make one point about like the difference maybe between nonprofit and like government yeah. run media just for a second. So people people see that. And um, so it's very interesting in the 1950s, this group, the Hutchins Commission, which was the Commission on the Freedom of the Press, they did a study of, of media in the U.S., and they're very critical of government run media, you know, which which would be in, that's owned by the government, let's say. But they're also very critical of corporate run media. And so what they say is what we need to find, we need a protection from government censorship, obviously, but we also need protection from corporate censorship. And I think and there are actually lots of places in the world who figured this out much better than we have, like the BBC model where they have government like the BBC, at least initially, it was government money, but it never went to the government. It went directly from taxpayers to the BBC. And so the idea was we don't want the government to get to decide that this money doesn't go to them. Right. And, an, and another model is actually in South Korea. They, their television model is that they, the advertising advertisers don't give money to networks. They give it to an intermediate organization who then, who then gives the money to the network so that you cannot have Advertisers can't say, I don't want to support that show anymore because you that's not your choice. So these are two models that I think are much better than the US. One about managing government money. And so how can we have government support without being government run? And how can we have corporate media without having market censorship? And so um, so I think those those are much better models. And so when I, when I say nonprofit, I'm thinking of something in one of those veins. It's that is protected from corporate censorship and protected from government censorship. And I think yeah. we can see, we're, we're seeing, you know, in all these questions, we're seeing the effects of corporate censorship. That yeah. is what we get. And, you know, we get these extreme things and we, that's why we don't get lots of other perspectives. Fascinating, fascinating uh, thoughts. And, and certainly uh, being mindful of time, we want to try and uh, get through some additional questions. And so I, I want to build off of what was, just shared uh, by all of you and uh, further reflect on uh, what we see in, in terms of the impact of the media. So the Aspen Institute uh, commissioned a report on information disorder and uh, some of the key findings from that order, uh, from that report. Uh, information disorder is a crisis that exacerbates all other crises, right? To when bad information uh, becomes as prevalent, persuasive and persistent as good information, it creates a chain reaction of harm. Uh, and so when we reflect on the crises uh, that we are experiencing, certainly uh, with COVID, uh, but then also with regards to democracy. Uh, uh, we can all uh, look at January 6th and realize that uh, the, the, the actions that took place that day didn't come out of nowhere, right? That there were various media platforms that spurred that on, all right? Uh, that, uh, that's a result of, or I should say a chain reaction um, uh, that resulted uh, in an insurrection. Uh, we see other issues uh, with regards to the ongoing challenge with gun control and, and how that becomes or how, how that's ma maintained itself as a polarizing issue and uh, the rise uh, in, in voter suppression tactics across the country. So we see a number of crises happening across the country. And so uh, the question that I have for the panel, um, what is essential at this point? Uh, what, what do folks need to consider in terms of being able to actively combat uh, these disinformation and misinformation campaigns, especially in this virtual era where folks uh, can literally tune into any media that they want and really uh, kind of reside in a bubble. Uh, what, what, what sort of uh, uh, features or tactics do we need to consider uh, as we are attempting to address, again, multiple crises? And uh, I, I put that open to the panel if anyone wants to take a first crack at that. I, I wanted to just say, uh, just reiterate, and then also kind of answer to, there's a, there's a couple comments um, about someone who is a, um, in K through 12 and doing mi uh, middle school and teaching. And I really do think that that's, it needs to start even earlier than that. Um, and I have seen some teachers doing it with my own children um, in, in various attempts. Um, so I have one child who understands that it can't just be Wikipedia, but that wasn't consistent with my other child who's trying to understand why it is when he looks up Bruno Mars, 
what what does cocaine mean i was like oh my gosh you know the, so this so and then you know they get into it about what is safe on the internet and and what is actual information and what is not um, and I do think that um, it needs to happen much earlier and much more consistently. We need to use the words that um, the that the act what they actually mean, not like a branding exercise like critical race theory, but actually engage in critical race theory, which is understanding the the permanence of racism at its intersections in our society and the ways in which we have challenged th these dominant ideologies across time, that our experiences are valid and valuable to answering the questions that we have here. We do not need to be to doing this on someone else's narrative or being reactionary. We are stuck in that position um, if we do not um, recognize that there are other times of historical crisis where they were using strategies that may be very useful to us in this time. And I do think that feeling unmoored is the is a very large part of it. And I do not think it is on accident. And so the more that we can ground our, our students in understanding that even their history books are constructed um, and for them to understand that, you know, what it means to read critically and to, to move in the world critically, um, then that, that builds that empathy that we need, that builds those, that, those thinking skills that we are sorely lacking in these other media. Tara, so right. Uh, it's interesting because history is told through the eyes of the victor. The past is what actually happened. And so to understand that it has to begin at a young age, yeah, I, I, an interesting thing on how, because of what happened, uh, I'll trace it back to 2005. I'm gonna jump into Brent's world in the uh, historical thing here. But in 2005 was the first streaming, YouTube was the first streaming. Prior to that, uh, the, how we consumed information, be it public access or corporate, was what was given to us. As of 2005, the public controls the consumption. So streaming, you, you control what you watch. You no longer are victim to whatever is being disseminated. So we have the, op with that, now that gives us the opportunity to present, like Tara said, at a younger age, the, the information that addresses diversity that addresses inequities. Now we have the control of that as opposed to the control coming from, again, networks, studios, or corporation. Uh, and so we haven't had a chance to take advantage. I don't think it's been taken advantage of to a certain degree yet. But again, now that, that the consumer controls it, it gives access to all of us to give the proper information out on a, a, on a, a mass scale. Does anyone else have any comments? I mean, I, I'll I'll be I'll be the negative Nelly on <laughs> Ron's query. Uh, I, don't, I think we can do a lot of things, but if we don't do it all in the same time and all in coordinated fashion, it's not going to do a lot, right? We, you know, you, you for every like school district where the the families put time in to really work and really get their district to listen to what would be healthy and empowering, empowering for the students and change it. Like if every other school district doesn't do that at the same time, it's not gonna be as effective, right? We, and so I, I get very worried that our very ability to act in concert comes in tension with this environment in which we're situated. The, 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 the the, the flip side of some of the positions is, is maybe, you know, like the more control I have to, to be choosy and to, to, to vote with my, my consumption is I might be positioning myself so that I also can't coordinate with others. 
because we we don't have the same consumption patterns. And so everybody gets just a lot of noise and everybody says, oh, we can make money in noise. And so I can keep selling and I can carve out my area and I can gerrymander my district so I can keep in power. And I'm going to make sure that my party reaches the same states and, and we can just keep rolling forward. So um, I don't know, but it's, it'd probably be appropriate for political scientists to just be a little pessimist. So I'll, I'll go with that. <laughs> Maybe I'll, I'll add one other thing and I'll, it will probably be pessimistic too. So don't worry. Uh, but, uh, and that's, that's just that. Um, so there's this historian named TJ Jackson Lears, who's a historian of ma magazines, primarily lots of things, but that's one of the things he talks about. And one of the points he makes is he, he looking at magazines in history, he says, American magazines have been about this, what he calls therapeutic ethos, where he says the magazines create problems for the readers that the advertisers solve. And I was just thinking about this with, you know, these comments about kind of the, the disorder. And this is kind of, this is what it, the media is doing, right? It makes it, if we feel unmoored or anxious, maybe that's, a, they think that's a good environment then to get us to buy things because it's like, okay, we're gonna try to stabilize ourselves one way. And um, so, so two, I still think more nonprofit media is one, one way but I think the other thing too, what Jackson Lear's comments say, and I think part of what everyone is saying, you know, what the media do is they take advantage of existing fears and anxieties. So, so we also, we have to address those fears and anxieties. So, so, you know, about critical race theory in the media, but also, you know, everywhere, right. You know, just those things in the world and about people's self images and body image and all of those things that the media take advantage of these, these anxieties that people have to sell, you know, diet products or to, you know, whatever it is that we, we have to address those issues too. Right. And so there's just so many and whatever anxiety the media can use to sell you something they're going to use. Right. And so it's also about trying to address those anxieties as, as much as we can while we also address the media and think about, think about the media. Thank you so much for your comments. So as, we, as we're coming to a close, I have um, potentially one last question. And that is what would you propose or how would you propose to regulate first about the current composition of the digital media landscape? I see, I see you going, wow, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, I, it's very interesting. I, um, as a media scholar, I'm happen to be friends with media scholars on Facebook, you know, among other people, you know, but, uh, but, but I, there's a media scholar that I, I, uh, respect a lot. Who, he said, we should nationalize Facebook. That was his argument. He was like, we should just nationalize Facebook. It should just be like a national platform. I don't, I don't know what, what I think about that. I don't know if that's the answer, but, um, but we have to do something. And, uh, and, 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 you know, I think that one of the Aspen Institute's suggestions is, you know, repealing the section 230, you know, part about like th that waves the platforms of their liability, you know, for things that they publish. And, and I, I agree with that. And, and I think one of, I think in a regulatory sense, we do not treat YouTube and we don't treat Facebook and, you know, we don't treat them as media companies. We treat them just as corporations, but I think we should treat them as media companies. We should say they're publishers publishing things. So we should be, they're like cable networks. And so we should, and, and cable networks, frankly, should be better regulated actually also. It, it, we regulate broadcasting, it, it, not, not, we have a good regulatory process for broadcasting, even though we don't always follow it, but we have less of a regulatory process uh, you know, um, process for cable, but it's more than we have for Facebook. So I think in the least we should start seeing Facebook like a cable company and, you know, and, and YouTube like a cable company and they should be regulated at least in those terms. Brett, that's interesting because uh, uh, the fact that I'm running a, uh, a network now that's, that streams content as, as well as a studio that gathers content, um, I'm constantly following what regulations that are mandates for myself based on what I'm trying to do. And because of the fact that the evolution of how we are disseminating whatever content uh, is changing at, a, at warp speed, uh, I deal in virtual reality quite a bit. 
and and not only virtual reality of content that is pre-produced, it's virtual reality content that's live stream. So now you have a regulation, like I, even though it could be as simple as um, a live, who knows, comedy club, I'm still under the guise of following specific regulations, no matter what. So I kind of agree with you where the more stringent regulation for corporations that currently are not falling under that would kind of get a better control of how information is disseminated and the consequences in which you give uh, erroneous information. Appreciate the insights. Uh, we have so many good questions in the q and I, I am, I, I wish we had more time uh, to get through everything. We'll, we'll, we'll likely have to have a follow-up conversation with you all. But uh, in, in terms of a closing question, uh, certainly we wanna think about uh, the potential impact uh, that higher education institutions can have in this space. You know, uh, higher ed is the place where we often uh, talk about what it means to uh, foster and disseminate knowledge for society's gain. Right, and so uh, to the extent that higher ed is probably in, a, in a, uh, the best position or one of the better positions to address this information disorder challenge, I uh, would love to hear from each of you, uh, what role do you think higher ed can play uh, in terms of being able to actively combat uh, the sort of information disorder environment that we're dealing with now? Um, and uh, we'll just kind of go uh, in, in presenting order. So we'll start with Andrew. Uh, a great, great query. And, and I, I'll just do a, a quick prior nudge in the prior converse, prior point um, that uh, my, my sense is if you wanna regulate media, you have to start with campaign finance technically as you're not gonna get uh, until you get politicians in office that aren't motivated by staying in office, you're not gonna get a regulatory structure that's gonna, that's gonna produce those kind of outcomes in the first place. Um, for higher ed's role, I mean, you know, the dream is of the university is that that's, that's what, 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 we're, what we're positioned to do is that we will have sessions like this where people, you know, ostensibly spend their time and their energy thinking about like things in a way where they're freed from, freed from interference. And right? it's how we kind of set this, that's what this model is supposed to be. Um, doesn't always succeed in doing that, right? And this, you know, I, I file my paperwork politely every year to make certain that I, you know, like, look, I'm not <laughs> bought and sold either, right? <laughs> you know, um, but I think the when you break down collegiate ed education, um, particular our connection to our undergraduates, um, at the core of a college classroom, it's having conversations about these things. Right? We're not. It's not a factory to say, here's some facts. If you know them, then the following can occur. It's training them to get to talk, to think, to argue, to push beyond whatever, wherever they're at, we want to move them, right? <laughs> like wherever your position is, I want, to, I, want you to, I want that to become shaky. And I think to the extent we can engage in that and, and make that our focus, even amidst the kind of content delivery that we want to do that certain professional career paths require us to do for our majors and our minors and our certificates to the extent we can have that critical reasoning, the, the, the thinking, the, the push uh, happen with our students. I think we're doing good. And then we have to find ways to, to bring those attitudes, to position our students, to bring those attitudes out into the world, to have these kind of conversations with the people that aren't in the collegiate sphere, sphere because college sphere is limited and it's isolated and there are patterns of wealth and equality and access that lead to who gets to go and who doesn't get to go and be part of that spot of conversation too. And so it's, it's spreading discourse, I think. I'd love to hear from others. All right, so uh, I, this is a great question. I really appreciate it. So one, if you're students, you could take my classes. I, you know, that would be one thing <laughs> I'll say, but. Uh, but, uh, but uh, more seriously, I, I responded this to someone's question like in, in writing, but I'll say 
I mentioned this thing, open television before. Well, that was actually, that was a project that was spearheaded by a guy named AJ Christian, who's a professor at Northwestern University. So he did research, he wrote a book called Open TV, and then he built this platform. So I think, you know, that's the kind of thing higher education could do too. Like, and, and uh, you know, there's a long history of college radio and, you know, college television really, you know, providing providing the access to to non-profit non-commercial broadcasting you know like the things that kevin is doing actually so so i think that's that's a role that that colleges can can play as as well and that's a that's a role in the community right you provide this i grew up listening to i i grew up in kansas listening to the radio station from, from wichita state university and i heard music and other things that i probably would not have heard otherwise so so and and that's a role that can that can hopefully be expanded right and uh I, I also i taught at san francisco state where once upon a time they had their radio transmitter basically taken away because they were you know it's in san francisco they were highly political you know um student radio station. So, so, but th those things, uh, I, I think those are things that we could do as well. I, the, uh, I find it very, that's a great, it isn't, this a great question somebody posed. Um, one of the things that I like to touch upon is again, it's a pedagogy element. And that is what I like to refer to as the Y equation. And that is by <laughs> acting like a three-year-old and asking why repeatedly. And that sounds ignorant, but at the same time, it is the it is the answer to all questions. The challenge of it becomes when you get to the point where it's uncomfortable somewhat for someone who doesn't want to hear the actuality of an answer. So by utilizing that in a, in a higher education uh, forum, whereas why does this exist? There's still another reason as you further push, why does this go on? Tara has, has addressed this when, when it comes to a historical element. Why? Why do people do a specific thing? Why did they say a specific thing? As Andrew said, the language that's used, specific language, it's intentional. Yes, it's intentional. It's called branding, to be very honest with you. If you don't mind me for a quick second, as I explained to my students, think of what branding is, where something becomes synonymous with a word, such as co cola mcdonald's like that's the greatest branding that exists my argument has always been the greatest branding that exists is the word slavery whereas if you think of that word you only think of maybe people in a field every now like whatever minor punishment somebody in a house what the word actually means is kidnapping rape torture think about all those elements each of those is a heinous crime that's what it actually is. But because of the branding of the word has desensitized us, there's no explanation to students when it comes to the educational aspect of the pedagogy of it. So that's why I think the, the use of the Y equation, W-H-Y, is a route that you would go with higher education to solve some of these problems that we're discussing. So, But certainly not least Tara. Yeah, just completely built just building on that um, uplifting the the work of, um, of of those who have come before me including Charles Ramirez Berg who basically is his quote is once minority representations are seen and understood for what they are the invisible architecture of the dominant dominated arrangement is exposed and there is a chance for structural rearrangement that there is, a, there is a larger goal for um, not just learning to critique, which is so critical and fundamental all along, but also how might we recreate and how might we do so in ways that are ethical and ways that honor our humanity and ways that um, push us forward um, and to, to see each other in ways that these media have um, obfuscated our view in the past. Thank you all so much. Uh, again, I, I think this conversation could have gone on for quite some time. And uh, as based on the questions there, you know, we, we certainly want to find an opportunity to continue this conversation. Um, I want to thank all the panelists for the incredible insight and reflections. And I want to turn to uh, our colleague, colleague and partner, Paula, to close us out. Thank you so much, Ron. 
wow, I, I can't imagine um, having had a better panel for this topic. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Lotz, Dr. Malin, Dr. Yasso, and, and, and Dr. Smith. Uh, we appreciate it. The depth and breadth of uh, your examination of media and its impact on our lives uh, has just been outstanding. So thank you. Thank you, Ron and Victoria, for your masterful facilitation. And to our attendees, the questions and comments have just been fabulous. Um, I would like to have a beer with like all of you people. <laughs> um, we'd like to extend the conversation on some level, so stay tuned. And on behalf of the Office of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion and the Office of Health Sciences, Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, um, thank you uh, and enjoy the remainder of your day. Uh, we will have another town hall coming up shortly. Um, and Ron, please remind me of the, the title. I had a sense that you were gonna share that and I was scrambling for it, um, but it is focused on vigilantism and uh, justice. And it'll be reflecting on uh, some of the uh, recent court cases uh, with uh, Rittenhouse, uh, Charlottesville and Arbery and really reflecting on uh, how we uh, take a look at the role of justice system and uh, the role of vigilantism uh, when it comes to uh, uh, racial inequities uh, in, our, in our justice system. So details coming soon. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Panelists.